By the end of the 19th century, the number of patients in insane asylums had been growing significantly. The rapid industrialization of the West, alongside its ever-growing population, had led to more people finding themselves in institutions than ever before. It would come to be known as the Asylum Era. And as the number of patients increased, the number of effective treatments that were available for them remained few and far between. People were suffering terribly, and we simply didn't know how to help them. Many of the mental illnesses that we study and attempt to treat today had yet to even be properly defined, at least defined in the way that we've come to understand them in recent years. This feeling of helplessness among psychiatrists led to a culture of something now called therapeutic nihilism, the idea that doctors and treatments were simply ineffective and there was nothing that people could do to help each other after all. The coming response to this was a wave of dramatic, invasive, physical therapies that would include electroconvulsive therapy, insulin shock therapy, and perhaps the most infamous of all, the lobotomy. A procedure that involves entering the brain and severing the connections in the prefrontal cortex. Despite being seen today as horrific and barbaric, the lobotomy would end up being performed 40,000 times in the United States alone. In fact, the neurologist who developed the original lobotomy would even receive a Nobel Prize for his achievement. For decades, the lobotomy was, for all intents and purposes, a mainstream procedure. It worked in the sense that it was able to pacify patients who were otherwise uncontrollable, those with bad schizophrenia who were combative and physically lashed out at other people, but the overall effects were devastating. Patients lost their personalities, sometimes completely, while others had their mental capacity reduced to that of an infant. Today, the lobotomy is almost non-existent outside of horror movies and serves as a grim reminder of how far we've come in such a short time as well as how far we still have to go. These are the stories of five individuals who underwent this procedure. Joseph Hassid, to many, was one of the greatest violinists to have ever lived. The tragedy is that we'll never know how great he would have been, because Joseph died when he was only 26 years old. Born in Poland in 1923, by the time he was 15, Joseph was training under Hungarian virtuoso and teacher Karl Flesch, alongside several other students who would go on to achieve considerable fame and success. Hassan's abilities were described as peerless, with those who saw him play stating that such a talent is only born once every 200 years. But the light-hearted, sometimes even a little bit shy boy was starting to change. Fits of rage and bouts of crippling depression began to take hold of Hazard as he grew. The diagnosis was schizophrenia, and in 1941 he was taken to an asylum for both insulin shock therapy and electroconvulsive therapy. His agent pleaded with the head of the hospital. He is nothing short of a violinistic genius and of such exceptional quality that we want to make the greatest effort possible to cure him. I would particularly like to stress that he is most exceptional and might have, had this illness not developed, been one of the greatest figures in the violinistic world. The treatments seemed to work for a short time, about a year, but ultimately they failed. And in the winter of 1942, Joseph Hassid was certified insane at just 18 years old. He was eventually moved to the Long Grove Asylum in England, where he would spend the rest of his life. His condition would deteriorate to the point where he was described as alternating between either sitting in complete silence or laughing uncontrollably. After his father's death in 1949, the hospital staff decided the only thing left to do for Joseph was a lobotomy. 
they performed it on him the following year. Joseph developed an infection following the surgery, which progressed into meningitis. He died a few weeks later, just before his 27th birthday. Howard Dully is exceptional in that he's still alive today. He's even more exceptional in that he wrote a book about his experience. At 12 years old, he became one of the youngest people to ever receive one of Dr. Walter Freeman's new transorbital lobotomies, also known as the ice pick lobotomy. The procedure was Dr. Freeman's solution to a problem he perceived in the world of psychosurgery. Lobotomies were expensive. They required operating rooms, anesthesia, and neurosurgeons to perform them. But what if there was a simpler way for someone to enter the brain? And so Dr. Freeman walked to his kitchen, retrieved an ice pick, and began to practice plunging it into the eye sockets of cadavers. It worked, and Dr. Freeman was performing ice pick lobotomies on live patients by the following year thus marking the lobotomy's transition from a highly complex surgery to a simple office procedure that could be performed by psychiatrists without general anesthesia. Freeman was perhaps as much a showman as he was a surgeon, driving thousands of miles for the opportunity to demonstrate his procedure, even sometimes holding an ice pick in each hand, entering both eye sockets at once for an added flare oftentimes not wearing gloves or a mask. With a mortality rate around 14% and many surviving patients becoming mentally incapacitated for life, it might be fair in some way to describe Howard Dully as lucky. As to why a 12-year-old boy would be subjected to a lobotomy, you might have to ask his stepmother. The woman was so frustrated with her new husband's son that she began consulting psychiatrists insisting that there must be something deeply wrong with the boy. There wasn't. If Howard was a rowdy kid, he likely had every reason to be. His mother died when he was just five, and his father remarried to a woman who seemingly just wanted Howard out of the picture. So when she couldn't find any doctor that would diagnose him with a mental issue, she took him to Dr. Freeman. The diagnosis was schizophrenia. The treatment? transorbital lobotomy. Eight weeks later, with his father's consent, Howard was rendered unconscious through electric shocks and Dr. Freeman placed orbitoclasts through each of his eye sockets and into his brain. He had no recollection of what had just happened to him. He was later institutionalized and then transferred to a school for troubled boys. Once on his own, he struggled with alcoholism and homelessness but eventually gained control over his life. He earned a college degree, got married, and became a state-certified driving instructor for a California bus company. It wasn't until his 50s that he began to research his own past, eventually teaming up with NPR and gaining national attention after discovering just what he'd been subjected to. Howard has since published his memoirs, given several interviews, and remains active online. In the final pages of his book, Howard compares his experience to that of young kids today, who are often diagnosed with things like depression and anxiety quickly, and find themselves on powerful medications without ever having gotten a second opinion. Rosemary Kennedy was the eldest daughter of Joseph and Rose Kennedy, the next sibling to be born after her brother, the future president of the United States, John F. Kennedy. Rosemary's birth had some complications. Because the doctor had not been able to arrive at first, the nurse who was present had ordered Rosemary's mother to keep her legs closed until he arrived. Doing this had caused her to be deprived of oxygen during the crucial first few moments of her life. The extent of the damage this caused is not really well known, as people have questioned how much of Rosemary's life the Kennedy family would have wished to keep a secret. But by age 11, Rosemary had been sent away to live in a special boarding school for mentally disabled children. At 15, she was sent to a convent, but she was tended to by the nuns separately, away from the other girls. 
The school reported that her cognitive abilities were at about that of a fourth grader. When the press inquired as to what Rosemary was up to, her parents would respond for her. They said she was busy studying to become a kindergarten teacher. At age 20, Rosemary was to be presented to the King and Queen of England, as her father was to serve as the U.S. Ambassador to the U.K. She had been practicing the royal curtsy for hours, and when the big moment finally came, she tripped and nearly fell down in front of everybody. But the crowd did not react, and the King and Queen just smiled warmly. It seemed that it wouldn't be a big deal after all. Upon returning to the U.S., however, Rosemary's condition worsened. She had turned violent, now lashing out at the people around her, hitting others in fits of rage and suffering convulsions. It was no longer possible to just stay in private boarding schools or convents. Her father became increasingly worried that she might embarrass him publicly, or worse, damage the family's political careers. He had learned of a procedure that could help her, and without consulting her mother, he took Rosemary to see a pair of doctors one of whom was Walter Freeman. It was 20 years prior to Howard Dulley's ice pick lobotomy, and Dr. Freeman was still partnered with a man named James Watts. Arguably more conservative, more professional, and better trained than Freeman, Watts would eventually end their partnership over Freeman's introduction of the ice pick method, an idea to which Dr. Watts was vehemently opposed. But in 1941, they were still working together and still performing lobotomies as a team. And in November of that year, the pair operated on Rosemary Kennedy. Dr. Watts recalled the procedure to author Ronald Kessler like this. We went through the top of the head. I think Rosemary was awake. She had a mild tranquilizer. I made a surgical incision in the brain through the skull it was near the front. It was on both sides. We made a small incision, no more than an inch. As Dr. Watts cut, Dr. Freeman would ask Rosemary questions. He asked her to recite the Lord's Prayer, sing God Bless America, or count backwards. They made an estimate on how far to cut based on Rosemary's responses. When she became incoherent, they ended the procedure. It was immediately obvious that the procedure was not successful. Rosemary had been given the mental capacity of a two-year-old. She could no longer speak or walk. Her parents responded by quickly separating her from the rest of the family, as well as by hiding her from the rest of the world. The family claimed that she had simply become a recluse. Her institutionalization was kept secret for 20 years and was only revealed after John had been elected president. The reason for why she was institutionalized was not revealed until 1987. She eventually regained the ability to walk later in life, but with difficulty. Her ability to speak clearly never returned. She remained institutionalized for the rest of her life until her death in 2005 at 86 years old. Sally Ionesco was the first ever recipient of Dr. Freeman's ice pick lobotomy. A 29-year-old housewife with extreme depression described as being violently suicidal. Roughly four years following the failed procedure on Rosemary Kennedy, Dr. Freeman, who was now working without the help or blessing of Dr. Watts, prepared to operate on Sally Ionesco. Again, using electric shocks to knock her unconscious, Dr. Freeman used his orbitoclast to enter Sally's eye sockets and sever the connections in her prefrontal cortex. He then sent her home in a taxi. Unlike Rosemary Kennedy, however, Sally Ionesco's procedure seemed to be what one might call a success. Sally had kept control of her faculties and went on to live a fairly normal life. Her daughter said the procedure had been like a light switch, like turning a coin over. She wasn't sure exactly what Dr. Freeman had done, but it seemed to have worked. It was a tough decision to make, sure, but for her mother, it seemed like the decision they had made was the right one.
Warner Baxter was an Academy Award-winning actor, best known for his role as the Cisco Kid in the 1929 film In Old Arizona, the first ever all-talking Western movie. By 1936, he was the highest paid actor in Hollywood. The handsome and charismatic Baxter was becoming a go-to choice for leading man roles. But as his popularity declined, so did his health, in such a way that would actually lead Baxter to seek out a lobotomy for himself. Warner Baxter was not suffering from any mental illness, but rather a chronic pain brought on from arthritis and what was later revealed to be a late-stage cancer. The pain was so unbearable that Baxter was desperate to try anything to make it stop. He had heard about lobotomies and their potential to alleviate his suffering. But his doctors were well aware of the danger. They advised him not to undergo the procedure, that he could permanently and irreversibly damage his brain. But Baxter was not deterred, and in 1951, he voluntarily underwent a transorbital ice pick lobotomy. His pain was gone, but so was much of his memory. He could no longer recognize his friends and began suffering seizures. Warner Baxter died a few weeks later. This has been the first volume of Unsettling Occurrences. If you want to learn more about these stories, check out the links in the description. If you'd like to see me make more volumes, please subscribe and leave a comment on what you'd like to see me cover. Thank you so much for joining. I hope to see you again.